Hello everybody. I guess my voice is okay there. Uh, my name is Tuukka Turunen. I'm from Dikia. Um, the topic of the presentation today is uh, how to use Qt, Qt Mobility and an upcoming uh, Qt Mobility Augmented Reality API to create uh, mobile augmented reality applications. So, um, the content of the presentation, first I would like to speak a bit about augmented reality, what it is, uh, where, when it was started, what kind of research has there been done, uh, the terminology and, and things like that, so that, uh, that we are all, all on the same, same page on what we, are, what we are discussing. Then some words about uh, augmented reality applications, different types that have been created and uh, how, how they are and so that you can get the um, feeling on what kind of things there already has been tried out and what, what might be possible with, with that technology. Then I talk a bit about the uh, Qt Augmented Reality API, which is uh, tentatively coming in uh, Mobility 1.2. Uh, I'll come back to, to later on, on that content. Um, then uh, I talk a bit about the showcase application that we have created uh, for this uh, event using uh, Qt, Qt Mobility and the uh, Augmented Reality API and uh, how that has been done, what kind of things we found out and uh, what, we, what was good, what was something that could be improved and then uh, a summary on, on the topic. Okay, now a short introduction to augmented reality. So, um, on the top you see so-called Milgram's uh, virtuality reality continuum from uh, beginning of 90s. Uh, on the left hand side there is the real environment which is the one we live in and on the right hand side there's a fully virtual environment generated and in between there is uh, an area that is called mixed reality uh, containing uh, areas of augmented reality and augmented virtuality. After this, uh, this definition there has been also some more definitions uh, on how the different um, areas are and what is which and a lot of uh, uh, academic debate. For our purposes I have simplified it so that we have reality, virtual reality and everything in between can be taught as augmented reality in essence uh, in, a, in a simplification of terms. I guess virtual reality is relatively familiar but just to check what it is uh, so virtual reality is, uh, is simulated, there's uh, no real components, there, there may be or there are components that are for example representing uh, objects in the real world or persons from real, real world that can be interacting with each other, uh, it's interactive in real time, so a movie is not virtual reality, uh, it's something that you need to be possible to interact. You need to be able to change the world around. So if there is a bird who is, that is flying in your virtual reality environment, you need to be able to catch the bird or interact with the bird. So that's, uh, that's a definition. And also virtual reality should be registered and rendered in a three-dimensional way such that uh, it is, uh, you, you can be in the center of the world. Whereas augmented reality is something that uh, combines real world and virtual objects. So typically it is such that main majority of the things that you see is the real world. But there are items annotated on top of, uh, of the view to give you something extra information, something that is not part of the uh, real world. It can be visual cues, it can be sounds, it can be basically anything, it can be haptics, anything that is added, added to the real world. Uh, it also has to be interactive in real time and registered in 3D. So not necessarily rendered in 3D, but registered in such way that you can see in which direction the items are. Okay, uh, moving on to an example, here's an old, pic old picture uh, that I once drew to uh, present how um, what, what kind of things there are. So on the okay, 
on the left hand side you see a normal view a photo of a meeting room uh, and on the right hand side you see the same meeting room with some augmented information there can be this kind of robocop type of just time date uh, annotation that is not necessarily fixed into any uh, physical location it's just fixed in the screen uh, se se same as this avatar on the right then there might be some items that are fixed uh, in the in the screen in the real world positions which means that you need to of course have a capability uh, to register uh, so some terms that there will be also mentioned in this presentation we already discussed this augmented reality virtual reality tracking means basically the a method and means on being able to uh, detect where the user is where the object is and where the user is looking uh, registration uh, is the capability of being able to place the objects in the right place in the user's view of the world and annotations are basically everything that are there all the things that are added are an annotations okay that much on the terminology then about the timeline so in the bottom you see rough timeline on how augmented reality is so the based on the virtual reality research and some science fictions uh, there has been discussions mentions about it uh, somewhat prior to 90s but actually the active research on augmented reality started as late as in the 90s so this is really relatively uh, short time from the research uh, until the time that we are uh, actually starting to see something uh, concrete something commercial uh, applied there in the 2000 there has been already some augmented reality uh, mobile augmented reality activities in phones there has in the parallel there has been some com commercial augmented reality applications for example in the military and for 2010 then we are expecting to see a wider consumer acceptance of the services especially in the mobile on the pictures you see uh, myself uh, about more than 10 years ago in 98 uh, wearing a backpack sized wearable computer it was something like five kilograms and there was two of these metal boxes one was filled with a computer uh, stacked uh, with the mainframe and the graphics cards for stereo vision and uh, wireless LAN box on top there and uh, digital uh, or differential GPS for positioning and electronic compass and in the um, in front of my eyes is a optically see-through head mounted display that was in this research system and then the other box was filled with batteries to be able to power the whole thing and then a hefty belt and a trackpad I still have the bike but not that much using the, that proto system or research system anymore and then in the right hand side you see another experimental system that we have created uh, in 2010 uh, about the location based uh, social networks using augmented reality we'll come back to that later but you can see that on the technology wise what has happened in 10 years is that something that was has been a research system has become something uh, that is available in all of your pockets or about everybody of you probably have such a device that is capable of augmented reality and that is uh, the main thing to enable the commercial, uh, commercial uh, success and uh, consumer acceptance that there are such devices that are handy to use uh, still on the basics a bit um, on the methods and means to do the augmented reality uh, there are several display types the optical see-through head mounted display that you so, saw me wearing uh, in the biking example then there is a, a, a possibility of having a video see-through head mounted display the difference between optical and video see-through is that the optical see-through provides you the view of the real world through a transparent uh, display that you can add to annotations and the video see-through uh, means that there are cameras that are taking the view of the real world and everything that you see is uh, embedded on the 
uh, image. There are some uh, benefits and drawbacks out of the, each of these, but not going into too much detail. They're actually the thing that most likely will be used in the early commercial steps is the one that you see in the phones. So a regular display and a camera pointing to different directions, being able to capture the image to your screen. And then there's possibility to use a stereoscopic display in all, all of these uh, categories. Uh, benefit of the auto -stereo stereoscopic display, of course, being the, that the annotations can be uh, perceived uh, as three-dimensional objects coming out of the screen um, as well. Then on the registration methods, the, the sensor-based registration is the one that is mostly used in the mobile augmented reality systems. Uh, especially this global positioning and, and orientation method. I wanted to list all of these there so that you capture the whole picture of, of how, how different types are, so that um, afterwards, when you think about augmented reality, you can think about these mobile augmented reality applications where you can browse for the information around you as one example of augmented reality, but not the only way to do augmented reality. So that's why I wanted to show this um, that there are things and some applications that require, for example, more precise tracking that can be provided, then they must be using uh, a limited area tracking device. For example, an area that is size of this room, it would be very easy to utilize uh, tracking that is almost millimeter accurate here. Small sensors giving very much accuracy on, on the um, the location and also on what, what is the orientation. But on the global scale, it is not possible to apply with such high accuracy, so the GPS and compass and gyroscope are the ones that we need to be using. Then some applications are marker-based, which means that there are uh, specific markers that are recognized from the video stream, and they, they are used to identify where which object is where. Uh, then it's possible to do registration with uh, image recognition from database so that we, for example, if we know where some building is and then we recognize that from the video that this is that building, then we can determine that the location without using a GPS there. Then some of the applications use random registration so that they, it doesn't matter where those things are. For example, some games, uh, there may be annotations uh, that you, for example, have to shoot down. It doesn't matter where they are as long as they are in some location. And then there are some uh, augmented reality applications that require no registration. Uh, they, um, they don't put anything to your view. They are augmenting, for example, as a measuring tape or uh, image search type of, of means. Okay. Now we are all on the same page on, on the augmented reality things there, what has been, how is the terminology and uh, what has been done in the past. Now looking a bit on the augmented reality applications, different areas where we can, where we can use this technology. First, uh, value chain for, <coughs> for wireless use. The reason for putting this value chain here is that you, I wanted to point out that there is in addition to just creating the applications, there are many steps in between who all have something to give to providing the augmented reality applications. At the end, on the right hand side, there are of course end users, the ones who desire to have these exciting new and valuable services. On the left hand side, there is the hardware uh, vendors who provide things that are capable of making this, uh, run, running this systems. There may be chips, there may be camera vendors, there may be display vendors, different, different of these categories. Then in the software framework vendors, there are things like Qt that make creation of, the, uh, of augmented reality applications easier. Then device manufacturers like Nokia who would be making such devices that allow running uh, augmented reality applications, operators who provide um, the local knowledge and also the connections for their and then service providers or ISVs who might be providing the application and services for the, for the end users. So something for, for each of the steps in the value chain. 
Um, so why, why mobile augmented reality? Why is, why is this new UI paradigm important? What are the benefits there? So as a natural benefit of augmented reality is the capability to interact with the real world. It's, it's very powerful, it's very easy to understand, very intuitive. You don't need to explain a lot that how is this user interface uh, working. It's very clearly, clearly something that uh, is easy to understand. And actually, for some uh, applications, for example, like a navigation application, it's much easier to understand than a map. So currently, the phones have uh, maps, and then you, then you have points in the maps. Uh, they are relatively easy to understand to anybody who has been using maps. But if there, but if there is such a person who has never seen a map, doesn't know uh, what it is, how to use it, then all those map-based navigation systems are of no use for these persons. So uh, uh, for this kind of uh, use, uh, actually augmented reality-based navigation is much, much more intuitive. Just showing uh, where things are in relation to the real world. Much easier, much faster. Uh, then as a benefit of augmented reality compared to virtual reality is that in augmented reality there is no need to generate the whole virtual model, uh, which is quite calculation intensive. It's in, we can just show the world as it is and then annotate the things that we want on top. Uh, benefit compared to other types of UI is the feeling of immersion. Sa same thing as with the virtual reality, you feel being part of the world. And especially with mobile augmented reality, when you look through the, div through the device, uh, of course, the feeling of immersion, feeling of being present in the world is very high because you are there in the world. The world is around you, you just get small pieces annotated. Uh, compared to, again, in a problem domain of virtual reality, uh, if the virtual reality model is created wrong, uh, it might be that the user doesn't feel that it's realistic, doesn't feel that it's in sync, doesn't feel that he belongs to the model. So all these kind of problems doesn't exist in augmented reality. Uh, also benefit of augmented reality is that uh, uh, it doesn't make you feel sick as much as using a virtual reality model for if you do it for a long period of time. There has been uh, uh, a lot of experiments and also some commercial virtual reality systems that act are very hard for the persons who are in the system for many hours. Uh, it's much less in the augmented reality. And of course, it's, it's fun, new and exciting. It's something that you can sell your applications, you can sell your products uh, with. Some difficulties in augmented reality, especially mobile augmented reality, is the limitation of market-based systems. So if you want to do something in a global scale, it's not possible to um, put the markers there. We must use sensors, and then sensors are not that accurate. It may be that certain kind of, uh, of uh, applications cannot be implemented. We come back to some examples of what is possible with the uh, really precise tracking, and, and you can then easily see why it's not possible with the uh, current uh, cell phones. Uh, if you want to do something that is, uh, has to do with the moving objects, then you need to very much uh, take care of the transmission delay. We come back to this topic a bit, but, but uh, it's very easy to understand that uh, if there's something like a building that is fixed there, then it's enough to move the information that this is a building, it's located there to the user. But if it's something that moves around, we need to be really fast in transferring the information, otherwise the moving object is not in the place where we told it to be at the time when the user gets the information where it is. Um, the capabilities of device are still a bit limited. Uh, we need to be taking uh, care that we don't make such applications that don't don't work or, or that they consume all the battery that uh, from the device within a couple of, of hours of use. Um, <coughs> so here are some examples of, of augmented reality. Uh, of course, uh, some, some products, uh, when they are designed, the augmented reality is, is part of it. 
So in a mobile phone, it's a it, it's a tool that suits for augmented reality use, but it has not been designed specifically for this use. But for example, in some uh, military applications, uh, they are specifically designed the weapon system such way that uh, they use augmented reality to point out where, to, where you are shooting and what is the right direction and, and all those instructions. Similarly, in, uh, in certain other uh, setups, uh, like maintenance applications, the whole application, whole, whole setup is built around the augmented reality. And it, it may be that in the future also there will be some parts uh, in the phones that are specifically included in order to make augmented reality use, uh, use easier. Um, for the consumer services, that is most of the focus probably here. Um, in the mob in context of mobile augmented reality, at least in the initial steps, uh, there are games, entertainment applications that can be created with this technology. Uh, a lot of the early examples have to do with service discovery and search type of applications, and then it's very much possible to use personal navigation and maps, as we discussed a while ago, uh, also with this technology. Uh, on the industry examples, it is such that depending a bit uh, on, on the problem domain, it may be already now possible to utilize the cell phones, utilize the uh, new cute augmented reality APIs, but uh, due to the fact that they many times re require very precise operation in a limited area, it's something that requires specific uh, tracking system or using a marker-based setup. Okay, some examples from uh, augmented reality research projects, just to, just to give you an understanding what kind of things have been designed. So, on the top left side, there is a museum kind of application. Uh, there is no need to have any specific markers, because it's a limited amount of things that need to be recognized. So, basically, each object in the museum uh, is in the database when the person points out to the muse to the object, uh, the system recognizes that this is that object and then gives uh, related information through the uh, museum guide. On, on the right hand side, there is a field application uh, in a military uh, use. There's a uh, tank, and in a tank there's a gun turret, and and there is a lot of uh, main items that need to be main, uh, maintained. And the current use was so that they have a, uh, this kind of a PDA type of, of system or a laptop where the information is that what should be done. And they tested that if they put the limited area tracking device there, they know where the person is, what the, what the point the person is looking towards, then they can point out information that first undo this screw, then turn this lever, then put oil there, and so forth. Using, using augmented reality, making it easier uh, to do the work, freeing both hands instead of needing to first look the information from a PDA, then deciding, that, okay, this picture looks like it's that, and then doing, doing the work. Similar things has, have been done, uh, for example, by Boeing uh, in uh, maintenance of the planes and, and such. Then on the uh, bottom left, there is a uh, small game or entertainment application called Invisible Trains. There is a trail, uh, a track, a wooden track, and then some markers, and then there are virtual trains that are running the tracks. And when you look them through the PDA, you can see that the train is there in the track. And then on the, <coughs> and this is a mark example of a marker-based based system. So markerless limited area tracking device, marker-based, and then uh, surgery, uh, in which is also limited area tracking. And in this example, you can find out why it's this kind of tracking devices must be really accurate. Even a one degree of, of error might be too much. So this application is such that um, there is a sort of non-intrusive uh, uh, surgery done to the patient. This kind of things that are, uh, if you, for example, remove some organ, they typically do it 
this way that they don't cut you open and take the organ out and then they, they rather do a very small hole and then inside try to feel that okay this is this must be this feels like like the correct organ and let's take this out that's how it's I know it sounds bad but this is how it's how it's done so because they don't want so <coughs> so of course it helps if it's possible to see inside the patients it helps so that if there's for example some doctors who are just or some surgeons who are just doing it for the first time it's it, it might reduce the amount of error so in this application there is a uh, um, ultrasonic scan of the patient and then a model out of that scan in real time that is rendered uh, on top of the patient so that then the doctor or the surgeon sees uh, what is inside the patient and where the needles and the instruments are going to. Similar things uh, have been uh, used, for example, breast tumor biopsy and, and those kind of applications already quite early. So this is a, clearly some a one area where, where augmented reality gives much benefits uh, and, and where there needs to be really very much accuracy in the tracking, but also we have very limited area. We don't need to do this kind of tracking everywhere. It's just in the in the place where in the hospital where you do these uh, surgical operations. Then coming to the mobile augmented reality, here are some examples of uh, real applications uh, created. Uh, on the top left, there's an application called Wikitude that provides you. Uh, um, it's possible that you install to your device. You can. Uh, see fixed objects there uh, and information related to that. Those objects similar to layer on the center and, and tonsi dot on top. It's just that uh, different organizations from different countries uh, have created but basically similar type, type of application. There's possibility to add many layers of information uh, and especially with layer it is such that uh, it's very easy to add new, new things in the new layers of information. Uh, with Tonsidot, it's also for the users, it's possible to add uh, information that is then visible for other users. So it's also kind of a social network, network type of augmented reality, reality application. Uh, in the bottom left, there's a very simple car finder application where you basically tell the application that here, this is where I parked the car and then when you want to find it, it shows you that this is the direction that you walk. So you basically just put a marker to yourself and then later you are able to find. Quite simple application. Uh, on top, top right there's an application called Twitter Round that shows you the Twitter feeds that are in the vicinity. They show that where the feed is coming from, from who and then you can see also the feed. It's a relatively popular application. And then on the bottom right, there is a one experimental augmented reality location-based social network application that Dikia created uh, in testing how we can do this kind of uh, uh, friend finding, friend finding thing that you have, you, you have your friends, uh, like Facebook friends, but they are then continuously providing location information where they are so that you can find. We te just tested the um, created this to test if this is already possible and uh, we found out that yes it's possible uh, to do but it's uh, very very resource intensive you need to have very frequent transmission on the on the position if, if you want to do the friend finding use case accurately um, a bit more of these those the first the first ones that I saw they were all sensor-based uh, applications here all of the mobile or application examples are uh, so, such that don't require the sensor. Uh, they are either using uh, a marker-based uh, approach or markerless random approach. So on the uh, top left is an, an experimental virtual pet system called iCat so that you can point out, to, for example, in this case, in the laptop screen, and then the pet is able to walk around the screen and interact in the virtual, virtual part of the world, or interact with the real world. Um, without knowing the markers, it can detect that what is the structure there and know that where to walk to. And then you can, you can point out that walk this way or walk that way, and, and then the pet do, does 
those tricks. Uh, on the top right, there's a game called Ghost Hunter, which is basically that it uh, basically puts randomly around you these ghosts that you can then shoot away. Um, similar game, by the way, was already in the beginning of 2000 present in the Siemens SX-1 uh, mobile phone. It's a similar idea. I think it was uh, the f uh, uh, mosquitoes or something in that case, but, but similar idea. Then on the bottom right is a, a Google Goggles, which is basically a search, a picture search type of application. Now you can take a picture out of basically anything and then uh, Google tells you what it is. And uh, Maybe in the future this can also happen in real time in the video feed. Now it's... Um, then you need to take a picture and send the picture to Google and then they tell back. And then on the uh, bottom right is a augmented reality measuring tape so that basically you can just measure things uh, around you with, with this application. Okay, so here were some examples just to give you an idea what kind of things there are that have been created. And this category was the one that initially uh, that, that is initially there with the cute augmented reality API, this kind of sensor-based applications that can be created easily. Uh, okay, now moving uh, to the requirements of mobile augmented reality. Some words on what it takes to build mobile augmented reality applications, what are important things to consider there. First of all, just to recap that what was discussed before, mobile augmented, re augmented reality is really resource-intensive application. It has to be designed carefully uh, so that we don't use too much of the resources and drain the battery or use so much resources that it cannot, maybe cannot run fluently in, in some device. Um, for a very simple uh, augmented reality application such as our showcase application, we, are, we need to use, when it's active, we need to use camera, we need to use GPS positioning, we need to use compass for uh, detecting the uh, heading, we need to use the orientation sensor for detecting in which di direction the uh, phone is, and we need to use the POI data source from the network to get, get the access there. Uh, we, we have to have the display on, display backlight is on, uh, we need to be able to take user input to the application. Uh, we use network resources, we use battery resources, and we use the storage resources of the system. So actually, the, in an augment, when an augmented reality system is active, there is very little parts of the device that is not used. So it's, it's an application that very much tests the, the limits of the device. And if you do it the wrong way, it's a very good application for those cold winter days because it, you can use it without gloves. The phone is so hot. <laughs> so, um, to the requirements. Uh, of course, these mobile augmented reality applications need a lot, lot less accurate positioning and, and orientation detection than, for example, those surgical applications. But still, uh, there is, uh, it is still very close to the limits what the devices can provide. Uh, most of the mm, typical use cases of the mobile augmented reality applications are such that the currently available high-end phones can do. They have enough processing power, they have big enough screens, they have uh, accurate enough uh, positioning and ori orientation detection mechanisms. Uh, but only when the operating conditions are optimal. So basically only outdoors without too much disturbance. If you take the system indoors, you lose the positioning. If you are close to metal structures or there somebody, uh, a car goes by you, your compass gives wrong, wrong headings. Uh, if the network is, uh, is congested, you are not able to use enough bandwidth to get the data and so forth. So it's, uh, it's an application that uh, before going to very uh, wide consumer acceptance, we need to have a bit more improvement in the devices uh, so that it's uh, 
we can be sure that in any operating case or environment it gives uh, satisfactory results. <coughs> I hope you can see the, the things in the table. The material, of course, will be available. So, but uh, here is uh, some of the key requirements listed. Uh, typically, the operating environment is needs to be global, not limited to any specific area. Primarily outdoors. In the future, hopefully, there are indoor positioning systems available, uh, such that, for example, VLAN-based. But now we need to rely on, on such methods that, that work best when not inside a building. Uh, we need to be able to tolerate some dis disturbances, especially this magnetic field disturbances. So we need to have some, some filtering there. Uh, we need to have, okay, registration, if we come back to the terms, registration was the capability of putting the annotation to the correct place. <coughs> we can have some error there, but based on our uh, studies, if the error in this type of application is more than uh, five degrees in ARC, the users will feel that it's not accurate enough. So we can if we are annotating something that, for example, there is a door, it can be a bit off, but it's, if it's completely off, the users will be annoyed. They, they don't, then it's not valuable them, for them anymore. Um, to achieve the five de degrees registration accuracy, typically we need to have a spatial accuracy of about five meters, which is something that can be achieved with assisted GPS in a good condition, but again, if we are in a, some situation where there are lots of buildings blocking the satellites or not, it's raining or something like that, it may be that, that we don't get the optimum there. Uh, heading accuracy, 1.5 degrees, is something that typically is reached with the electronic compass when it's not too much disturbance around. And in case of the moving objects, uh, end-to-end -end data transmission needs to be very, very fast. So about one second, which in essence means that uh, before we get uh, more accurate positioning, more accurate orientation, it will be very hard to do this kind of uh, moving object uh, based, for example, this friend finding use case. I have some, one example there later on how the, how the error is, uh, ha happens based on these factors. Device size for the consumers needs to be something that they can put in the pocket. Well, that happens in a, in a mobile phone quite well. Uh, the features in the device, we, we, need, we need to have a GPS, assisted GPS for positioning. We need to have a di digital compass. Preferably, we need to have a gyroscope for being able to give a uh, non-disturbed orientation. There's no gyroscope in these current devices, I guess about the only uh, mobile phone gyroscope is the new iPhone at the moment, but it's still possible to do others. In other phones, there just needs to be uh, emphasis put to the filtering. Um, then we need to have an orientation sensor in many applications to know how the user is tilting the application and what direction the phone is. Uh, well, naturally display. We need to have a camera and the camera should be pointing out as it typically is, and then we need to have a sufficient processing power in the device to be able to calculate all those uh, annotations and, and such to the right place. And finally, uh, the users don't want to have their battery life significantly uh, degraded, so that, uh, meaning that it's okay to use power, but, but we, if, the, if it drains the battery in one hour, then it's uh, a bit... Um, a bit too much. Okay, now to the accuracy and how the <coughs> how the error uh, accumulates based on the, this. So in the bottom you see the user. Uh, on the top there's this actual location of the annotated object, and then there are error that comes from the error of position, detection of position of the user, and possible error in detecting the position of the object. So of course. If it's a building, it typically is right, but it could be that 
in the database there are errors in that. So those errors in the position error, then the orientation error detecting from the compass, and then a transfer delay in case of the if the or the object is moving. And um, as said, uh, key to good user experience is being able to give this registration accurately. Um, and in a sensor-based situation, it's we are very close to the error what user can tolerate, which means that uh, uh, we need to be careful, for example, in such things that how we draw the annotations, what kind of expectation we give to the user in the visual cues of the annotations. Do we, do we point out, do we make them very small, precise, or do we make them big so that actually the annotation covers it covers several degrees on the screen. If the annotation is, if we, if we think, if we know that the user can accept five degree error, we know that our system gives 10 degree error. By making the annotation a bit larger, uh, it's, it's easier for, for the annotation to be on top of the, of the object. So these kind of very simple things in the application design. Uh, need to be taken care depending on the use case. If we have such a use case uh, where we um, have very slow or non, not moving object, we can use, uh, and, and the user may be also stationary when they are looking around, we can use quite much filtering and averaging in the filtering so that we get more precise position, but then we also lose in the capability to react to changes. So if we have an application where the user typically is running around and trying to see a friend, we cannot that much filter and because the filter will make, make an additional error in the case when the, either the user or the, the friend are moving very fast. So these kind of things need to be taught and the filters need to be adjusted accordingly to, to what your application is. And this, as said, this one second end-to-end -end transfer time is a hard requirement because it in essence means that every 400 milliseconds you need to be able to send and receive positions if, if you have a server-based system and if you have a peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer system then of course uh, it's the one second. Uh, then, then moving to the Augmented Reality API. This is uh, tentatively part of uh, Qt Mobility 1.2. Tentatively here because the final scope of Qt Mobility 1.2 hasn't been uh, fixed yet, but this is something that is, is, uh, has been told to us that this is the target, that it comes, comes there within the schedule of, of, of Qt Mobility 1.2. What the API does is the, is the capability of adding the augmented reality annotations on top of the camera view using a sensor-based registration. It provides a possibility of filtering the sensor information so that the accuracy uh, of the annotation can be increased. It uses the mobility APIs for, for providing the landmark data. So if you have some application that is already using uh, a good mobility location API for getting the point of interest, you can directly use the same point of interest uh, data in, uh, in your augmented reality view on this application. And uh, it's possible for you also to, of course, create your own point of interest, uh, do the same API. And this uh, augmented reality API also takes the following of the changes in the sensor data uh, and the location, location, orientation, position uh, automatically so that your application doesn't need to be pulling where, what the sensor values is and where to put, uh, where to put the annotation. A more detailed view on the general architecture. Uh, so on top you have your own augmented reality application and then you write a point of interest provider uh, for the application uh, uh, for the, under the location API so that you get, so I guess you have been on pre previously know how the location API works so it basically gives a abstraction layer on the 
on the location and then you need to take care if the point of interest data comes from your own repository, if it comes from Google repository or whichever, you need to be able to do those plugins, those backend plugins there uh, to the location API. So that's the that's there. Then in the augmented reality API, the key parts is this augmented reality manager applicate uh, or pa part that takes care of getting uh, the data from the position source. Basically, it's the is in is the assisted GPS from the compass and the rotation sensor, and also providing a basic filtering uh, of those those values to increase the accuracy uh, of the information. Then there is an augmented reality camera widget, which uh, gives the uh, basically a camera viewfinder view that you can decide where to put into your application if you want to have it a full screen view or some part of the application. Uh, then in that view there comes the viewfinder uh, data from the camera. Uh, then there is the augmented reality POI widget, which is basically a single point of interest. The uh, floating around in the screen representing your annotation and there's a possibility of, of detecting the boy taps uh, so that you can you can touch the boy and get for example further information on the boy uh, point of interest or the annotation and uh, it's also possible uh, with this API to, 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 to change the sizes of the uh, annotations and as we have done uh, they are not the same size in all locations and you can use the, also the altitude Z coordinate or you can disable the use of Z coordinate depending on your, what you are doing because uh, current GPS is such that uh, the altitude value is very very inaccurate, in, uh, inaccurate at the moment so if you, are, if you make an application that displays you a mountain tops in mountains so you have an application where you are in the Alps and it shows you which peak is what. Then you can have the Z coordinate on. But if you want to have an application that tells you that uh, which is the fourth floor where the apartment is, the accuracy of GPS is not, uh, or the CPS that we, we can use. It, it, you need to have the military frequencies to, to get this accurate. So rest assured, those missiles know where the fourth floor is. And they will hit the correct, but the mobile phone doesn't know. And then there's this augmented reality visualization uh, component that uh, puts those uh, annotations in the correct place in the screen. And this uses all the mobility, so all those screen are the, the all those are parts of the mobility. So so it uses the mobility camera. There's no specific camera, and it uses the mobility landmarks and so forth. So whatever you are doing with the mobility, adding the augmented reality is there. You don't need to rewrite uh, those parts that you have already used. Uh, the, uh, then maybe some words about when, when. So this is this was. I know that this is a bit high level uh, information, but car what is currently is that this API is uh, provided to certain parties. Uh, uh, like, like certain forum Nokia champions and, and, and certain companies like Digia uh, under NDA and it is when it, it as, as normal all the cute APIs sometimes there comes this technology preview then it's public to all and then it, it uh, is, is frozen and, and released so now we are in a, in a place where not all the information is, is yet available but uh, I'm glad that we, agree, we were able to all give you this much information so that you get get uh, understanding and I hope that with, with this you can sort of capture what is coming and the details on the API and the interfaces and those then they, they can be checked when the technology preview is, is there. Uh, then some words about the showcase that we created and our findings uh, findings with that. So, uh, bringing uh, three-dimensional annotations to mobile augmented reality, that is the key that we have in the, uh, in the showcase. Uh, many of those application examples that I showed are such that um, uh, have fixed size 
a uh, fixed uh, location of, of uh, annotations, we wanted to bring uh, the perspective there. So basic, in essence, very, very basic thing, the things that are closer, they are on the bottom of the screen and they are bigger. And those things that are farther, further away, they are on the top of the screen and smaller and in between. And then when you adjust the range, uh, those uh, move in the screen. Uh, the annotations itself uh, are unfortunately not OpenGL because of some performance restrictions in the current devices. But even without it, it's, uh, the effect is quite good uh, in the immersion. And then there are these different uh, or these, um, controls that you can adjust the distance filter, how far, how far object you will see, and then uh, uh, a wheel that displays uh, which channels you can have active. And we have some channels there for, for restaurants and uh, hotels and uh, cafes and, and friends. Here is basically the same uh, uh, architecture, a bit simplified how we use those. So as said, we use uh, the cute mobility APIs as they are, landmarks, API, position sensor, camera, through the augmented reality uh, API. And then we have created our own uh, backend for the point of interest, and we use Google service search, uh, and uh, then uh, not yet there, but we wanted to use the Facebook places, but it's not outside US that you can still access it. But uh, but that is something that we will add there. And uh, then we used one external component, which is the uh, uh, QJSON component that takes the JSON array data from Google and decodes that. Uh, here are some pictures of the showcase. Um, uh, so basically, here you can see that those things that are smaller are behind and those that are bigger are closer to you. Um, we have the showcase in Dikia booth, so you can come and, and check check there how it is. In the in this concept, you see the, the screen coming to both sides. At the moment, we have this um, black bars uh, there because the camera was we was not yet able to scale to, to the wide screen view, but something close to this is, is there. So what were our findings? Uh, on Qt benefits, we can state that the Qt is a very powerful tool for creating this kind of visually rich and performance intensive applications. And it's much faster to write code than, for example, on the native Symbian code. Uh, Qt mobility is a great thing. It allows us to uh, get a streamlined use of all those technologies that are there in the device and make it easier to port from device to device. So that your cross-platform capabilities are built in when using Qt. Uh, using the augmented reality API greatly simplifies the creation of the sensor-based mobile augmented reality applications compared to, for example, the example that I show you on Android. There we had to write everything ourselves. Now we are just able to take the augmented reality and concentrate on the application and those sort of the hard things, which is thing should be registered, where, where the annotation should be put, those come through the system. And we almost everything that we did was, was there directly on Qt. Only the JSON was a plugin, and that was also something that was readily available. We didn't have to create it, but was not a standard feature of Qt. Then some areas of improvements. Um, we had some problems with the camera API. Uh, due to the performance, there was uh, chosen that it's a native viewfinder, and then we were not able to use those hardware accelerated graphics of the N8 and those. Uh, or we were able to use those, but then there was this kind of black uh, rectangle around. So what we had to do is to turn off the hardware acceleration, go back to raster graphics, and then we can make them translucent so that they are so transparent in, on top of the viewfinder. So this is one area that I guess will be, uh, will be improved in the further versions, hopefully, so that we can use, because the, in the future, more and more devices have the hardware acceleration. And especially when it comes to OpenGL, 
um, annotations, we, we really need to have it there. So don't be too much worried, but that was something that when we did this was not yet available. Um, we have uh, some, uh, some minor functionality had to be created. For example, in the landmark API, we didn't find a good way to handle those duplicates. So if we do a Google search, there comes data, then we do another search, there comes data, so that we don't have the boy many times there. Uh, that we created ourselves. Um, then, um, then we had some problems with uh, limited capabilities. For example, we no, were not able to use the OpenGL. And uh, then uh, there's, um, since we have the camera active on the N8 device, there seems to be that the graphics memory is uh, a bit limited because the camera already takes a part of it. So we we were not. So it's not possible to put. Uh, infinite amount of point of interest there. We need to sort of re, uh, restrict the search to some some limit so that there's the amount of points. It's not a big problem in a sense that if there would be a huge amount of those point of interest, then also the screen would be filled with them and the application would be uh, not usable. And then the battery life is not very good because all those things are active. So it's something that the augmented reality application is something that the user could use for a while, but if we make it so that, for example, that uh, it would be used constantly, for example, navigating uh, from place to place, then it probably would use too much battery over an hour or so of the use. And then the electronic compass is very much prone to disturbance, especially here inside, you can see, uh, but also outside. <clears throat> so the filtering is quite efficient in the API, it helps a bit, but really, it, so as an improvement uh, area for Qt, we propose that you put the gyroscope in all the Nokia devices. But that's uh, perhaps not up to us to decide, but it would really help in augmented reality. Um, Cross-platform, so as you probably all know, Qt enables it. Uh, without Qt, without Qt mobility, there would be a huge amount of work porting this kind of augmented reality application from a Symbian device to a Migo device, because it uses almost all of the hardware that there is in the device. So mobility is uh, a must, and that's why we are very happy that the augmented reality has been created part of the, or the augmented reality app API is part of the mobility and leverages the mobility uh, seamlessly there. And we were able to make the whole application almost without any platform-specific code, only very small things like access point selections and uh, some things like that we used Symbian code. Then summary and future predictions, so that there is still time for questions. So uh, our vision for the mobile augmented reality is that there will be no single application for mobile augmented reality. It's rather a user uh, interface style that will be there in a whole number of, of different kind of applications. There, there are many benefits on, on augmented reality in navigation, information search, social networks, games, uh, field services, and, and you name it. So there are a large number of applications that benefit out of this. So you can sort of compare this to other UI paradigms such as that you have a graphical UI instead of a textual UI. So there's a huge amount of things that you can use it. The same way here with augmented reality. Uh, some future directions we see. Now the applications and device capabilities are good for augmented reality browsing. Uh, in the future it will be more interactive. There will be more games, more of this friend finding, social networking, navigation type of things that require uh, or enable you to interact with the world more. We see that the sensor capability will be improved. We see that most likely gyroscopes will be there in more and more devices. We uh, hope that uh, indoor positioning is finally enabled so that technology is there. Somebody just has to do a global uh, fingerprinting database out of the VLANs and then we get enough good indoor positioning. And then the GPS improvements and is very good. So at the, at the time, there's, uh, the EU is, is working with the Galileo program. It will provide accurate positioning when, whenever it's there. 
and the uh, US government has been committed that they improve the GPS system so that they add uh, new frequencies for also for civilian use that will greatly in improve the um, position accuracy. So, so these things are happening there and, and will help mobile augmented reality. And the displays will be in the future more uh, of the auto stereoscopic displays that you don't necessarily need to have any these uh, 3D glasses, but you can look to the display, especially in this kind of small display that's in the device, it's uh, quite possible to do, and you get an, a more immersion to the uh, application with, with this. And then we see that the battery life will improve through a better software, uh, software that is able to more effectively use the resources, uh, such hardware that is made with uh, less um, um, than less width in the silicon so that it uses less, less power and also we see that the batteries will have to improve. Ten years ago was the last major improvement on batteries so it's about time to change the technology in, in batteries so that we again get the ten, order of 10 magnitude uh, capacity increase in the, in the batteries so that, that will probably happen someday hopefully. Okay so as a summary uh, we have used uh, uh, this new augmented reality UI paradigm and we see that it offers uh, many benefits for different types of applications. Uh, research on augmented reality started in the uh, 90s and uh, now commercial services are starting to appear. Most likely next 10 years will, will be time for a wider consumer acceptance on, on these type of services. Uh, Cute augmented reality API is coming. It enables easy way to create mobile augmented reality applications and this should come uh, Qt Mobility 1.2. And, and that we have a showcase application in Dikia stand. And you can come after there's a break after or there's time after this presentation and also during the break to still see the app. I guess we will be heading something after four today home so that we can catch a plane. But before that, uh, and if you have any questions, you can ask now. There's about 10 minutes for questions and uh, then I will be available after the event and, and you can email. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, when will the API be released? Sorry, the API, uh, the, the release date of the API. Do you know anything? Uh, it should be. It should come within the mobility 1.2. And around when? I'm. I'm. I'm not allowed to say. Is there any draw, any cute people here who are allowed to say? Okay, here's the. And second. Please give a mic to just the product manager of the mobility. So if okay, we yeah. want to develop an AR application right now, uh, what should we use? Sorry? If we want to develop an augmented reality application right now, what yeah. uh, can we use right now? Is there an a open, a open source API or ah, library? It's, it's now available as a pre-pre-technology preview for Forum Nokia Champions through Nokia. Nokia. So that's, but now we get some comment on the time. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, it's part of Mobility 1.2, as uh, Turka said, and Mobility 1.2 is scheduled to be released um, in the first quarter of next year. Okay, good. So, r relatively soon. I have a tons of questions, but I try to limit it and talk to you later. Okay. Um, first question is, um, when you use only the accelerator and the magnetometer, um, you're limited um, to the to determine the orientation of the device and the position. What are the limits in the um, API, or to to react on which the user orientates the phone and so on? Yeah, the API gives you uh, the heading uh, with the compass, and then you can get the direction so that you can adjust. For example, in our showcase, we do so that we don't use the C coordinate but we rather do simulation of that so that when the user tilts the device, we move the annotations up and down so that we simulate the direction that is pointed. So this kind of thing is possible through the API, but it's up to the developer to decide uh, what to do with the uh, rotation. 
Um, then which kind of filters are included in the API? Uh, now there are relatively simple filters so that we use in the positioning. The good way, good way to filter the position is by averaging. Uh, so so uh, particle filters or common filters aren't included? Uh, okay, in the filters there's actually th there's two type of filters. One filter is that you can decide which boy is in visible, but in the data the correct filter comes by defining what is the error in the data. And in the position error, it typically is so that when you get many positions and average them, then you get really good uh, result. In a uh, compass data, the error comes uh, with uh, so that the values, you can get values like you get uh, 150, 151, 150, 152, uh, 20, 150, 152. So there might be this kind of completely off values that come through disturbance. So in, the, in filtering the uh, compass, you n not necessarily need to average, you rather compare the new values to an average of uh, past, like let's say past five values. And if the new value differs very much out of the average, then it's most likely an error and you can discard the value and continue. So different types of filters to different and uh, unless I'm mistaken, the filter is something that can be changed. So there is a default filter and then uh, the application has, can change because different type of asset, different type of applications need different kind of capabilities out of the filter filters. Um, and my third and last question would be, um, when you have the pre-pre version of the API, have you tested it on different, different Symbian phones or is it at the moment limited to the one you've shown? Uh, it works on Symbian phones. Uh, <laughs> And, and it works on, on other phones, but now I, I must admit that I, I don't know what is the official statement of the mobility in other than Symbian phones. So uh, I'm a bit worried to answer you. So um, augmented reality, it's using uh, just cute mobility APIs as a fundamental uh, building blocks. So it'll be running on where mobility APIs are running. So um, we have a, a compatibility table uh, as part of our documentation and it's available on the internet. So you can go check out what uh, census APIs are available on this, this, this platform and uh, camera APIs are available on this, this platform. So you can, you can check it. Yeah, but in essence, it's you. It's it can be guessed that it's it's uh, on Symbian and Migo first. So, yeah, one. I guess there's one more. At least one more. Yeah, question time. Uh, look, look into the future. Uh, I, I I I'm hoping now that we we got a statement that in 1.2 we, we we get this included. But but looking then for for 1.3 and then a future on. Uh, do you see that it is possible to, to do image recognition and image tracking as well on the phone? Do uh, you believe it's techno technology uh, possible to do that? Yes, the, the, yes, it's possible already now. Uh, I hope that it is a direction that can be taken in the mobility APIs as well because uh, now there has been this sensor based, but there is also quite much benefits in, the, in uh, this marker based or image recognition based things that could be similarly improved. But definitely you can use it, but at the moment you just need to write the thing yourself. But so maybe in the future it, it can evolve into also other than sensor-based directions. You want to say something? Um, I just, uh, add, I just wanted to add that uh, we have a face recognition API uh, as a candidate in 1.2. So I think um, that they relate to each other in a way. Yeah, so similar, probably similar as with, with now they have been using the uh, sort of the augmented reality API uses the other mobility APIs and, pro and leverages them to create what is needed for augmented reality applications. So probably this could be then used. Uh, myself, no, uh, not, not in the queue. I have been doing it in the past, but not in the queue at, at myself. I don't know if Dikia is doing something there. Is, uh, face recognition is uh, 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 built internally, so um, we have our own uh, uh, algorithm to detect the uh, face, and um, it. it, it